from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am evil. Not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello again, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast. This is Alyssa Carroll, and I am your host and the creator of at serial underscore killing on Instagram, where we go through the life stories of serial killers to see if we might catch a glimpse of why they displayed their famous, vile, and disturbing behaviors. This week's podcast will be on Anthony Sowell. Anthony was born on August 19, 1959 in Cleveland, Ohio. So let's get into some history before that time. The year before Anthony was born, the United States imposed an arms embargo on Cuba. Guerrilla troops then attacked and captured Santa Clara and were successful. In 1960, Fidel Castro and the victorious revolutionaries arrived in Havana. Castro then became the prime minister of Cuba, then forced the Cuban president into exile, then appointed a new president and promptly aligned himself with Soviet Russia after being rebuffed by the United States. And speaking of the Soviet Union, the then Vice President Richard Nixon engaged in an impromptu debate with Soviet Union's leader, which took place at a U.S. trade show that was being held in Moscow. It was known as the, quote, kitchen debate. The two leaders argued over the positives of capitalism and communism. This debate was filmed by the American press and aired in both countries. Also in 1959, the people of Tibet revolted against the Chinese in Lhasa, but the uprising was suppressed. This prompted the Dalai Lama and many other Tibetans to flee to India. To this day, the Dalai Lama is still in exile, but continues to try to work for peace between Tibet and China. There was also rampant flooding in Taiwan, which killed about 2,000 people. In Japan, Typhoon Vera slammed into the Japanese island of Honshu with winds over 160 miles per hour, killing nearly 5,000 people. And in the Congo, the very first human with HIV died. The islands of Hawaii officially became the 50th state as the President Eisenhower signed the Hawaii Admission Act into law. Alaska was also signed in as the official 49th state this same year. Also in 1959, Abel, a rhesus monkey, and Baker, a squirrel monkey, became the first to survive a space flight after being launched from Cape Canaveral in the United States but the Soviet Union had had dogs launched and successfully recovered as well. The Antarctic Treaty was signed in Washington, D.C. by 12 countries who had been active in the Antarctic region in 1958. These countries were, of course, the U.S., the U.K., Soviet Union, Norway, Japan, New Zealand, South Africa, Belgium, France, Argentina, Chile, and Australia. The treaty was to ensure peaceful use of the uninhabited continent for scientific purposes. The Soviet Union crashed their Luna 2 spacecraft into the moon. This was the first man-made object to actually reach the moon's surface. The wildly successful TV series, The Twilight Zone, premiered on the CBS network. To this day, this show still ranks as one of the most unique and best written television shows in TV history. Popular movies at the time were Sleeping Beauty, Ben-Hur, 
and Some Like It Hot. Singers that were popular at the time were Doris Day, Frank Sinatra, Jim Reeves, and Ella Fitzgerald. Along with the Twilight Zone, people were watching Bonanza and in the UK, the Jukebox Jury. So this was the atmosphere that Anthony was born into. His father was Thomas Sowell Sr. and his mother was Claudia Garrison, though it was very apparent that she went by the name Gertrude as that is the name that's always listed in quotations. Thomas was apparently quite the ladies' man and had several children with other women. Multiple sources made it clear that Thomas really was not much in the picture at all. Thomas died in 2003 when Anthony was 44 years old. So Anthony was one of seven children and though I couldn't find his specific birth order, the summation of the information leads me to believe that he was most likely either the youngest or one of the last having siblings much older than him. His mother had actually had five children before she was 18 years old. And as I stated before, Anthony grew up in a fatherless household. His grandmother and mother both ruled the house and all of the children endured horrific abuse at the hands of both women. Claudia had a habit of stripping her children naked, tying them to poles or banisters and whipping them, usually with electrical cords. These beatings were almost daily she and sometimes the grandmother beat the children so severely that it left permanent physical scars scars so bad some of her children wouldn't even wear shorts when it was incredibly hot outside so that they wouldn't show now there's not a lot of detailed information about anthony's very early years but as he aged his oldest siblings of course grew up and moved out as they began starting families of their own, one of Anthony's earliest memories was of an older nephew forcing Anthony and other very young family members to perform sexual acts on each other. This nephew in particular forced Anthony to perform oral sex on him. Anthony also said at the age of about six or seven, he was given a quote, chatty Kathy doll and that he did quote a disturbing thing to the doll a few times until he was around the age of 9 to 11. One of his grown sisters unfortunately passed away and she had two children who were forced to go live with Claudia and their grandmother. So of course those children were not spared any level of abuse either. Now, around the age of 11, Anthony later stated that he was sexually molested as well as raped by a family member. And this would be the turning point in his life. One of his nieces that had just moved into the house after her mother passed away caught his attention. She was 11, he was 12. He would fight her and bother her until she finally gave up and then he would rape her and he wasn't the only one. The woman later testified that other males in the house raped her too, almost daily. This house was a house of horrors. I can't seem to find whether or not he actually graduated high school, but I do know that he never really had a girlfriend and that he was quiet and kept to himself. In January 1978, 19-year-old Anthony Sowell joined the U.S. Marine Corps. And that, folks, was his childhood. So I found some testimony from experts from the later trial that I will share here, but we do see a childhood marked by sex and violence. Children were tied up and beaten mercilessly and regularly. The abuse was horrific, to say the least. Social worker Lori Town testified during the trial and displayed a chart detailing the mental illness and physical problems on both sides of Anthony's DNA. She said physical and mental problems were, quote, rampant throughout the family. She called his family dysfunctional. 
She said all of Anthony's siblings reacted to their harsh upbringing by acting out in various ways. Lori believes that they have no boundaries. Anthony's siblings exhibit all kinds of issues, drug abuse, sexual dysfunction or obsession, overeating, seizures, lack of ability to care or empathize, and so on. You see, the consequences of experiencing child abuse and neglect are considerable, as we all know. Some of us go on to lead fairly normal lives, like myself, while for others, the effects are chronic and debilitating. Anthony was exposed to what experts call multi-type maltreatment. Complex trauma can result in multiple and interacting symptoms, disorders, and affects the broad range of cognitive, affective, and behavioral outcomes associated with prolonged trauma. Evidence suggests that there is a much higher risk of abused or neglected children going on to repeat that cycle with their own children. Growing up in a home that uses aggression and violence as a viable means for dealing with conflict can increase the likelihood that the cycle of violence will continue as they reach adulthood. Adults with a history of experiencing child abuse and neglect are greatly at risk, much higher risk, to experience physical health problems, including diabetes, gastrointestinal problems, arthritis, headaches, stroke, and heart disease, which will be important to remember for our story. Persisting mental health problems are also a very common consequence of child abuse and neglect once they reach adulthood. These include personality disorders such as antisocial, paranoid, schizotypal, borderline, narcissistic personality disorders, and so on. They can display post-traumatic stress disorder, dissociative disorders, depression, anxiety disorders, and even psychosis. Depression is, of course, the most common one. Then, of course, we have the issues we already know come with child abuse, which is a higher risk of drug and alcohol abuse. Some show suicidal behaviors, eating disorders, and obesity, which lines up with what the social worker described about Anthony's family. There is a marked increase in aggression, violence, and criminal behavior. They often participate in high-risk sexual behavior as well. I mean, I think we can all agree that Anthony came into this world without really even a fighting chance. So let's get back into it. Anthony indeed joined the Marine Corps and reported for boot camp at Paris Island, South Carolina. Of course, he was eager to get out of Cleveland because he had gotten a girl pregnant. His daughter was born eight months after he joined the Marines. There really is no information about his performance while he was a Marine. Most all of that is, of course, confidential, but we do know he was trained on how to subdue and kill using his hands and how to use nearly any kind of object as a weapon for killing. Once boot camp and basic combat training were over, he was taught electrical wiring. After, he was assigned to the Marine Corps Air Station Cherry Point in Havelock, North Carolina as an electrician. And for once in Anthony's life, things were good, predictable. He was highly regarded and respected. He actually earned several awards and promotions during his years with the Marines and even made it up to the rank of corporal. This, of course, would be the only high spot in Anthony's life. He even got the chance to be stationed somewhere in the Pacific for a year before returning to Cherry Point. He met a fellow Marine named Kim Lawson, and in September of 1981, the two got married. Later, Kim would state that Anthony had a serious drinking problem, and she married him thinking that she could help him. She didn't want to see him get a dishonorable discharge, but once Kim was out of the Marines, she promptly divorced him. In 1985, after being stationed in Okinawa, Japan, Anthony left the Marines as well. Now, 
The Marines did state that Anthony went AWOL for two months once, but again left the Marines in good standing. He then returned home to East Cleveland, which had changed a bit since he had left. Most of his familiar area that he had lived in was now well below the poverty level. The city's finances were in serious trouble, and he began drinking very heavily again, and by his own admission, getting very angry. The area also seemed to be infested with crack, which was then a very potent form of cocaine, and it was everywhere in the 80s. The crime rate rose dramatically, and the female population was hit particularly hard. Women so desperate for that drug that they would prostitute themselves for it and were walking the streets. 25-year-old Anthony had been gone for seven years in the military, but was already divorced and was not doing what he should for his now seven-year-old daughter, and it would appear that the mother of his child was going after him for child support. He was drinking from the time he awoke until he went to bed or blacked out completely. And when he drank, he became more aggressive. In 1988, Anthony was arrested and charged with domestic violence and was in jail for eight days. He was charged again that same year for being in possession of dangerous drugs, though it didn't specifically state what drug that was. But that's not all he was up to. There were three murders that year and the next that have not been specifically connected to Anthony, but he was suspected. Two bodies were found near Anthony's home. The women were suspected drug dealers. The third body was found in her own home, not far away and had been strangled to death. Then in 1989, a young lady had willingly gone to Anthony's house she was three months pregnant so when she decided to leave he tied her hands and feet with a necktie and a belt then gagged her with a wash rag he then began to strangle her to the point that she later said quote my body started tingling i thought i was going to die unquote he violently raped her repeatedly and then finally passed out She waited until he was asleep to kind of wiggle out of her restraints and later told the authorities. Anthony was arrested and charged with kidnapping, rape, and attempted rape. He only pled guilty to the attempted rape charge and was sent to serve a 15-year sentence in prison. While there, he actually tried to help himself. He attended Alcoholics Anonymous and Adult Children of Alcoholics, as well as attempting to sign up for a sex offender treatment program, but he absolutely would not admit that he was a sex offender, so he was turned away. Sources also say he took courses like Living Without Violence, Cage Your Rage, Positive Personal Change, and even Drug Awareness Prevention. The prisoners, though, described him as a, quote, demented and psychotic pervert. He was released in 2005, serving all of the 15 years. Anthony was described as a model prisoner while incarcerated, and the psychologist said that he was unlikely to rape once released. Once out, he decided he was going to help those women who were messed up on drugs and were prostituting themselves. He would offer them alcohol, friendship, and even let them stay in his house. But if he, for a moment, felt like the women weren't appreciative or slighted him even a tiny bit, he would verbally and physically assault them. He would also sometimes rape them. He drank beer and apparently barbecued a lot, according to his former neighbors. Though he seemed to blend in, some thought he was still pretty strange. He began dating Lori Frazier, who happened to be the mayor's niece. While they were together, Anthony was good to Lori, who was a former crack addict. She lived with him in his house and believed the relationship to be serious, that he was not seeing anyone else. However, 
He started a dating profile on a website for fetish seekers, stating he was a, quote, dominator looking for a slave to train, unquote. He remained active on this site until his final arrest. In 2006, he got a job in a factory and was described as a good employee. He did suffer a mild heart attack while on the job, but returned to light duty after he was cleared. Just a year later, Anthony didn't bother to show up for work for two days in a row and he was fired. He started selling scrap metal to make money. The next year, he and Lori split up, but she said that she had begun to notice a horrible smell that was coming from his home. He blamed it on his mother who was living there at the time, though she moved out in 2008. And Lori wasn't the only one that noticed. His neighbors were noticing it as well, but thought it was coming from a meat supplier business next to Anthony's house. Along with the smell, women, mostly addicts, began to go missing and at an ever-increasing rate. The smell emanating from Anthony's house was getting stronger. Women reported that they went to his house where they would smoke crack, drink, which has been a proven combination that leads to aggression, and if he became disturbed in any little way, he would attack them and beat them and rape them while strangling them with a cord. But then, once he was done, it was reported that he became rather docile, offering them food and money. One woman disappeared in 2007, five in 2008, and eight in 2009. As is the way of some serial killers, he had to kill more and more often to satiate his need for that lust. Finally, in September 2009, a woman went to the police stating she had been attacked and viciously raped and strangled with an extension cord by Anthony until she passed out. The police went to arrest him, but he was not at his house. Though I could not find out if they had obtained a search warrant for his house or how they legally gained entry, but they did, and the smell had to have been obvious. After a search of that home, they found two rotting corpses buried in shallow graves in his basement. Four other deteriorating corpses were found on the third floor of his house, I mean heavily decomposed. They found three more bodies buried in the backyard and the very decomposed remains of a fourth woman as well. They also found a woman's skull in a bucket in the house. The bodies that weren't too far gone were determined to have been murdered by strangulation and showed ligature marks around their necks. They found Anthony two days later and made the arrest. He was 50 years old. Ultimately, Anthony was charged with 11 counts of aggravated murder, 74 counts of rape, kidnapping, tampering with evidence, and abuse of a corpse. He tried to use the insanity plea, but in July 2011, he was found guilty on all but two counts and was given a death sentence. He is currently on death row. When asked what triggered him to commit the murders, he said, quote, I don't like people who hurt kids, especially women. Women are supposed to be our protectors over everyone else, but that's not the way it is, unquote. His house has since been destroyed. He was given the name the Cleveland Strangler. He has since apologized to his victims' families and is appealing his sentence. So I believe we have a case of nature and nurture here. His family, according to experts, had a history of violence, addiction, and mental illness. There is a sort of a gene for violence that is inherited through the mother that I've discussed in previous podcasts, and I think it's safe to say that that most likely applies here. He was also raised in a house where there was rampant and horrific child abuse, sexual abuse, and so on. So 
it shouldn't come as a surprise that he grew up to be a serial killer. All of the ingredients were there. But what do you think? Leave me a comment on Instagram at serial underscore killing or a comment on YouTube under the same name of this podcast. I have a website, serialkilling.squarespace.com, and consider sponsoring the podcast. I have a Patreon. Every little bit helps. I appreciate it. And thank you so much for listening. I know that you could be listening to anyone else, but you chose me. Thank you so much, and have a great day.